I will. I'm going to turn this one on. He took, gave me the lapel, so I'm going to turn it on. It's hard to follow that singing. That was amazing. Uh, thank you all so much. There has been a lot of controversy about that song. But you can't argue God's goodness. I was just sitting there thinking, as good as God is, God can't be bad. Ever. God makes no mistakes. He never misses anything. I heard, I was listening to the preacher coming down the road, and uh, uh, he said, uh, I want to tell you, God's not broke. He is not intimidated. Uh, the world has not got him by the collar, and uh, God is still on the throne. Amen? Amen? And uh, I'm glad he is tonight. You know, I want to read something to you. I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 12, if you will turn there for me. But Sunday, I preached out of the book of Philippians, and uh, I'd never seen this. Many times that I've read this, many times I've quoted this, many times as I have studied this, Paul wrote and said, y'all have to pray for me. I, I cry a lot, so y'all just, y'all just get used to it. My wife uh, gets used to it, and the church knows it, and so... Uh, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. And I used to think verse 10 meant that something that's coming in the near future, but it actually means right now. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should, and that, that every tongue should confess. We shouldn't wait on it to happen in a future day. It ought to happen now. Amen. We hear His name. It ought to do something to us. It ought to stir something down in the depths of our soul. We ought to shout. To be honest with you, I'm grateful that He took an old sinner and saved me, Amen. and gave me life. Hallelujah. Amen. I appreciate your pastor. Yes, people told him to quit, and I said, don't quit. I said, God, don't call a man and make a mistake. God, don't make mistakes. That's right. I'm glad he doesn't. Amen. All right, John chapter 12. You pray for me tonight. I want to preach for just a few minutes on a worker a worshiper, and a witness. A worker, a worshiper, and a witness. The story begins actually in Luke chapter 10. If you want to go back and read in Luke chapter 10, you'll find that there was a time that Jesus came to the house of Martha. And Mary was there at that time also. Lazarus was not there. Uh, Lazarus, some one writer said maybe Lazarus was gone on a trip, maybe he'd gone to town, maybe he'd gone, you know, to work, we don't know. But when she came, he came the first time, he fellowshiped with Martha and Mary, and he left. And I'll get into the details of that in just a few minutes. Well, then the Bible tells us there was another time he came to the house of Simon the leper, and Mary came, and she took ointment and poured over the head of Jesus. And of course, she got fussed at for that by Judas Iscariot and said, why are you wasting this? You know, that money could have been taken and used in some other fashion. And, you know, Jesus said, don't fuss at her. This was done for my burial. And I'll get into that in just a minute, too. Uh, I may get done tonight and I may not, so you all just pray for me. <laughs> uh, but when we come up to chapter 12, Chapter 11 is an amazing chapter, of course. We know that story, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Think about that just for a moment. What an amazing event that was. And then we come to chapter 12, which happened, they say, probably about two weeks later. But if you'll notice the first verse of it, it says it was six days before the Passover. You know what that, what that meant? Six days before he died.
Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. For Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this, for the poor have always you have with you. But me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus, whom also whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests, the religious leaders, the high pious, the spiritual, supposedly spiritual ones of that day, consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We're so thankful that you're here and we thank you for your presence, your power. We thank you for the songs and the singing and for the opportunity tonight to fellowship with the people of God, to be here, to, Lord, just to try to share just a little bit of something from your word. And I pray that you will lead our hearts tonight. Help us, God, that we'll have our ears on, our hearts on, and we'll listen, we'll take in, God, what you have for us. And Father, I pray tonight we'll be challenged on this. And if there's someone, Lord, maybe here or maybe listening online, and they do not know Jesus, may this be the very hour, may this be the time that they realize that need in their heart. And I pray, Father, tonight, may you stir our hearts that are sitting in this building tonight. God, may you stir our hearts, God, to get excited about who we are and about who you are. And Father, may we go forth and show the world who, who you are so that they can know you and they can be saved. We love you tonight and we thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The house of Mary was in a little town called Bethany. Bethany was on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, about two miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus was not far from where he was going to be taken and put to death. He was not far from where his enemies, the headquarters of his enemies. Uh, I was reading something this afternoon, and it said that, or actually this morning, and it said on one side there was a kind of a desert area, and that's where all the prophets kind of came from. And on the other side was Jerusalem, where all the prophets were put to death. Some of them were raised over here. That's where the prophets got their desire, and that's where the prophets were put to death. And that, Jesus was right kind of in the middle of that place where he was at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus there, about two miles away. And he was in this city. He had come earlier, as we said a while ago. He had been there before. He had been there on a couple occasions, maybe more than just the, the ones that are recorded in Scripture, because this was, in a sense, uh, Jesus' home away from home. That's where he went when he needed to get away. That's where he would go when he needed just, you know, just to kind of uh, be there and unwind. You say, well, the Son of God needed to unwind. He was a man just like we are. He, was, he got hungry like we get hungry. He got thirsty like we get thirsty. He got tired like we, got ti we get tired. He, 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 he endured or he encountered all that we encounter. And so he'd go there and he'd rest and that's where he was. And so it was there that he came. Uh, Bethany also is the place where he, as I said a while ago, he ate in the house of Simon the leper. And then it's where he also gave his disciples the great, dis, you know, the great Olivet Discourse that we read so often in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, about future events. But he came here at this particular time about two weeks after uh, this amazing event had happened uh, not far from where he was. And so he came to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He came there to just to, to have a time of fellowship, a time to rest, a time to kind of relax, to regroup and get himself ready because in just six days, he was going to die. 
Six days. Think about that just for a moment. Put yourself in the in the shoes of the Savior for just a minute. From the moment he was born, my friend, uh, Satan was plotting a, uh, a, 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 every, at every angle, every place to try to get rid of him. Satan was doing everything he can to get, get rid of Jesus. As a matter of fact, when he was born, the Bible tells us, they set out to kill all the, the, the babies that were two years old and under, and, and they had to leave the country. He came back and, then, uh, and stayed for a while. And then everywhere he turned, every, at every corner, Satan was trying to get rid of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here he was, six days before he was to die. Six days before he knew that he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be falsely accused. They were going to take him and they were going to scourge him. And they were going to uh, pull his beard out. They were going to spit on him. They were going to slap him. They were going to hit him. And then they were going to nail uh, 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 nails in his hands and his feet and hang him between heaven and earth, between God and man, uh, to be the sacrifice. They thought they were killing a criminal, but my friend, it was actually the Lamb of God that was being sacrificed for our sins. And so here he was at the house of Mary and Martha. He was getting ready to face all this stuff that was going on. And much has transpired in the life of this family. Much had gone on uh, in this time. And of course, they were getting ready for him to come. I can just see the scene at this little home. Don't know how big it was. Don't know how many, you know, how much square footage it was. Doesn't make any difference. But Martha was, uh, she was busy about getting a meal prepared. And Mary was busy about getting uh, the ointment ready. And then there was Lazarus who was eagerly anticipating of being able to see Jesus who had done so much for him. And so Jesus gets there. He gets to the house. And my friend, he gets there. They bring him in. You see, the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus kind of can be symbolic of the church itself. It can be symbolic, my friend, of where we are. Uh, It it, it is this this place where the members of the family of God, we meet, we fellowship together, and we come with anticipating the presence and the power of God just to move in. We come together, my friend, that we come to fulfill a time of worship and we are amazed at, uh, at him when he comes in and he begins to minister to people's lives we, uh, think about just for a moment when people come down they get saved it excites us but it also amazes us that God can do what God does and we meet here this is the house that Jesus meets in just like it was the house that he met in for Mary, Martha and Lazarus And so we come together, my friend, we come together unto worship. And my friend, as as he did in those days, he needs a Martha in the church. He needs some Marys in the church. And he needs some Lazarus in the church. You say, what are they? Martha is a worker. Mary was the worshiper. And Lazarus is the witness. And I want to share with you just a little bit about those three people here in just a minute. We find, first of all, as you begin this whole story here, we find a, a place of welcome. Uh, this place where they were welcome. Uh, the house that Jesus came to in Bethany was a place that he had come to a lot of times. And every time he'd ever come there, they welcomed him. It was a place, my friend, filled with their love. It was filled with hospitality. It was a field, my friend, a place that they opened their arms. They welcomed him in. They brought him in. In, and he came in and he felt very comfortable being there. You say, when we come to God's house, we ought to come here, my friend, and we ought to come and we ought to welcome him in our midst. Matter of fact, we ought to pray that he comes down and he comes in our midst to do the work that needs to be done. Because if Jesus is not here, we might as well as go home. If he's not here, nobody's going to get saved. No ministry is going to do anything. And I'm going to tell you something there's no need for me to be here preaching. Amen. amen. Y'all say amen. 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 And so we find as he walked in the house, there are two things that happened. First of all, they received him. The Bible says that the scripture says he came. Uh, they made him a supper. Mary served. Lazarus was one of them. that saved the table. They received him. I can imagine what it was. They were anticipating his arrival. And when he got there, all the preparation had been done. They had prepared themselves. They prepared their house. I don't know what all they did. 
But think about it just for a moment. What if they knew Jesus was coming? They probably got the brooms out. They swept out the floors. They, they dusted all, all the mantles off. They dusted all the stuff off. They got everything ready because they were preparing themselves to receive God's Son into their house. I want to ask you a question. How much preparation have you done for the service tonight? You might say, well, I, I didn't think I need to prepare. Folks, we need to prepare every time we come to God's house. We need to come, we need to come ready. We need to come prepared. We need to pray, and we need to pray, and we need to pray, and come prepared how to hear and listen and see what God's going to do and, and be obedient to the voice of God. We ought to prepare long before we ever get to church. I know a lot of times we'll say, well, preacher, I only pray when I get to church. Shame on you. You ought to pray long before you get to church. Well, I only read my Bible when I come to church. Shame on you again. You ought to, you ought to read the Bible. You ever thought, I, I, and there's been times at church, I'll get up and preach, and after church service, I have Sunday school teachers come up and say, you know, we, we, we studied that in Sunday school this morning. God must have been on the page. I said, man, yeah, he was. You see, they prepared. I prepared. We were listening. We heard God's voice. We knew what God had in store for us. And so we came prepared. We ought to, we ought to receive him, prepare ourselves for him, and receive him, and then be obedient to him. Amen. Second of all, they not only received him, they reverenced him. They knew who he was. You see, in this home, he was a guest. That was, they recognized who he was. They gave him the honor that he was worthy of. And I'm sure, my friend, when he sat down at the table, they put him at the, at the most prime place. What about us? I hope tonight you came with all the intention of honoring Christ, exalting him, and making sure that he is the focus of everything. We, we center all of our service around Him. It's not around me. I'm just the mouthpiece. Sometimes not a very good one. My wife knows what I'm saying. But everything ought to focus around Him. We ought to reverence Him for who He is. Amen. And not just here. And I'm talking my friend. We ought to, we ought, he ought to be the honored guest in the church. We ought to pray that Jesus shows up. We ought to pray that Jesus shows off. We ought to pray, my friend, that we honor Him. We, we, we focus on Him. We put Him in the center of everything. Amen. And then we do it at home. We do it at work. We do it at school. We do it at our place of business. We do it wherever we are. That our lives evolve around Jesus. You see what's wrong with our churches today, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to get, get into something I shouldn't, I guess. But we make him revolve around us. We don't schedule our lives according to what? Around Christ. We schedule Christ around our lives. We've got this thing out of order. Let me show you these three people. First of all, we find God needs people that work. Martha was a worker. I, am I in this home, Martha, and as they welcome, you're going to find that she's busy. She's prepared a meal. Now, go back just a little bit. You're going to find that, that Martha, my friend, was a very industrious person. She was one of those people that she had to have her hands. She had to be doing something. She had to be busy doing something for the cause of Christ. And so we find on two occasions that we are given this description of Martha. She's always doing something. Home one was before the raising of Lazarus. The other is at the, after the raising of Lazarus. So look back in Luke chapter number 10. You're going to see a Martha there that my friend was, she was working out of a sense of duty. She just knew that was her duty. That's what she was supposed to do. 
I, we're given the first time she's there. In Luke chapter 10, we see Martha worked out the sense of duty. As a matter of fact, the Bible says she cumbered about, and the word for cumber in this is the Greek word persepeo, and it means to be driven about mentally, or to be distracted, or be overoccupied, too busy about a thing. You see, sometimes we can get too busy that we push Christ out. You see, while Martha, Mary was worshiping at the feet of Jesus, Martha was out. She was busy. She was working. And in Luke chapter 10, she was, she was so encumbered and so worried and so, uh, you know, so uh, distracted with all this stuff. She was more concerned with her work for the Lord than she was with her fellowship with the Lord. Sometimes we get so worried about the work we do for Jesus, we forget to take time to fellowship with Jesus. I spend a lot of time in my study. I got a little, it's a bedroom actually, and I got a desk there, and I got a computer there that I type my notes up on. I got all my books there, and my wife is a, Saturday night, Tuesday night widow. Y'all get that when you're about halfway home. Because I spend a lot of time on Saturday nights and a lot of time on Tuesday nights. I do on Monday too and I do some on Sunday and I do some on Thursday and some on Friday and, and most of it on Saturday. I spend a lot of time there. And I've caught myself so many times uh, spending so much time there that I forget about spending time with Jesus. I get so wrapped up in my studying. I get so wrapped up in reading uh, the Bible and, and wrapped up in typing my notes. I, I, I think I've got to get this done. And he's trying to say to me, no, take just a moment. Let's fellowship together. You see... Really, work and fellowship should go hand in hand. She focused on just the work for Jesus uh, to the exclusion of her fellowship with Jesus. She was serving out of a sense of duty rather than a sense of gratefulness. And in the chapter 10 of the of book of Luke, she complained. She murmured. She, was, she went to Jesus and said, I, I, why don't you make Mary help me? Oh, preacher, I can get in some stuff here. You know, a lot of times we say, well, go to the preacher and say, why don't you get so-and-so to help me? They're too busy doing something else or trying to worship a little bit. Why don't you get them to help? I'm the only one doing anything. Right, well, let me tell you something, folks. We're not the only one doing anything. That's what Elijah said. Elijah said, Lord, I'm the one. I am the only one that's faithful. I'm the only one that's taking a stand. I'm the only one. You know what he said? I hate to break the news to you, Elijah, but you're not the only one. I got a few more down there that's never bent the knee. Well, we find not only in Luke chapter 10 a sense of duty, but we find in John chapter 12 a sense of devotion. After the day Lazarus was raised, everything changed. I think Martha began to see, my friend, who Jesus really was. I believe she began to sense that there was a need uh, uh, to, to, to show a time of devotion and fellowship with Him. I think she realized, my friend, that yes, we ought to serve, but we also ought to take time to worship. You see, I wonder if Mary learned that before service for the Lord, there must be fellowship with the Lord. You've got to have time to fellowship with Him before you can go forth and really serve Him. I read something many, many years ago as a young preacher, and that was a long time ago, by the way. If I make it till next April, it will be 45 years I've been doing this. So it was, I was young. And I read something that said, so many times we spend more time in study than we do in prayer. Prayer is our way of fellowship. And he said, for every half an hour of study, spend one hour in prayer. And he might say, 
Wow, that's a long time. It is. But it's something that's necessary. If you ever get a chance, y'all, there's a book called The Power of Prayer by the man by the name of E.M. Bounds. And in that book, he, he tells us of these great men of God who, who many of them, if they, they knew they had to start their day at 6 o'clock, they would rise at 4 o'clock and pray the first two hours of the morning. And one man would get up every morning. He would put on his work clothes, his work shoes, his work shirt. He'd put on everything he knew as going out to work. And he would go in his prayer room and pray for two hours. And somebody said, why do you dress? for work because he said sometimes prayer is work but she came the second time of a sense of devotion Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 and whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him and then in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 he says do all things without murmurings and disputing listen when we serve God out of love out of a desire for fellowship with him our service becomes joyful and fulfilling it my friend it just does something to you and we won't murmur and complain about it We don't serve because we want to. We have to. We'll serve because we want to. I don't serve because to be saved. I'm already saved. I serve because I am saved. And I just want to give him something to honor him. Let me get on with the second person. We find Martha's the worker. We find, second of all, there's people that worship. Mary is the worshiper. Mary is this woman of humble spirit. Now, Mary, this Mary is not the Mary uh, that was the mother of the Lord. She was not the Mary, the, the lady that came early on, who was the prostitute and anointed Christ or, or, or cried over his feet and washed her, his feet with her hair. Uh, she may have been one of the Marys that went to the tomb. I didn't say that. But she was just, she, she was just a Mary. And she had come to realize some things about the man Jesus that to her was so very important. And now I feel assured she did not feel that she neglected her service for the Lord, but she felt like that there was this, this importance of, first of all, worship. Just worshiping for who he was because she understood the order that was needed to be the most effective servant that she could be. So she begins with worship. And notice two things about this worship. First of all, you'll notice that that there is the faith of worship. She took that that oil. She took the oil, the spikenard, a very expensive oil, and she anointed the Lord Jesus. To understand a little bit about this, you go back to the book of Luke chapter number 10 where he had taken one of the times that Jesus was there and Mary had taken the seed in his presence. She was right there where he was. She was listening. She was hearing what he was having to say. What was he saying to Mary? He might have been saying, Mary, not long from now, I'm going to go and die. Not long from now, I'm going, to, I'm going to take the sins of all the world upon myself. I'm going to go to that cross. They're going to nail me there. I'm going to bear this. I'm going to be the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Paschal Lamb that is going to die for the sins of the world. Maybe he, he had told her all this. She began to realize who he was. She was soaking up all this stuff. And then when Jesus came back the next time, she was ready. She was ready. Maybe through the instruction of the Holy Spirit, she had taken her all, all her money. Now, this is a very expensive ointment. It cost the average person in that day about a year's wage to buy it. So Mary, she took, by faith, she took her money, she went and bought this pound of aromatic incense. Some kind of very, very expensive aromatic perfume. And she comes in to where he is and, and takes this and pours it on his feet and washes them. You see, what Mary was doing, 
This is a faith of worship. You see, well, instead of going to the grave to anoint Jesus, the body of Christ, as the other ladies did, she was going to anoint him now. She, instead of paying her respects and her worship then, she was going to pay her respects and worship now. My friend, she was going to give her tribute there that day in the home where the Savior had come to be while she lived. You see, you might, might say, how does this apply to me? If we take the time to sit at his feet and to listen to what he's got to say as he fellowships with us, it's going to move our hearts to an act of worship. You're going to want to worship Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something tonight, folks. If the songs they sung tonight didn't move your heart, there's something wrong. It stirred something down in my soul. I mean, think about the goodness of God. Think about how gracious He is. Think about how, my friend, by mercy and grace, He saved us. He brought us out of the uh, the hell holes of this world. He brought us out of the darkness of sin. And my friend, when nobody else wanted us, and Jesus said, I'll take you. And He cleaned us up and made us a saint of God. Hallelujah. That's about enough to shout on. Amen. We have the opportunity today to open our hearts and worship right now. You say, right now? Yes, sir. We ought to worship him. My friend, we ought to lavish on him praise and honor and worship. And my friend, we ought to do it for the very fact of what he did for us, what he uh, sacrificed on our behalf. You see, Jesus died for you. Wait a minute, I'm going to say that again. Jesus died for you. Amen, preacher. Jesus died for me. Nobody else did that. Nobody else would do that. Jesus died for me. He's not dead. He is alive. But he died for me and for you and for the world. He died for that drunk. He died for that drug addict. He died for that harlot. He died, my friend, for the atheist. He died for the agnostic. He died, my friend, for the baby killers. He died for the rapists. He died for the adulterers. He died for all men. He died for those that, my friend, lash out at him. Those that deny his name. Those that ridicule. Those that curse. Those that crucified. Those that, my friend, that despised him. Jesus died for all them. We should not ever have to wait till there's a tragic event in our life to offer our worship to Him. And so many times that happens. So many times we wait till something bad happens until, until I mean, we get to that point, oh God, I need you. Well, where, you didn't need me yesterday. I need Him every day, folks. I mess up all the time. And I need Jesus. So she, my friend, see the faith of worship. But notice... Not only the faith of worship, notice the fragrance of worship. This, this is something that just excites me. The Bible says in verse number 3, the very last part of this, the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. When she opened that little bottle, the house was filled with the fragrance of her worship. And her worship didn't go unnoticed. Everybody knew it. Everybody, my friend, experienced my friend Mary's worship. They may not have known what it was, and they may have not known exactly where she was, but they knew what was going on. If you really turn loose in worship, it's going to affect everybody in the house. And if you don't turn loose in worship, it's going to affect everybody in the house. Think about it just for a moment. I can see the picture of Mary. I'm going to come down. Don't do this much anymore. You don't go up steps so good like I used to. I can see Mary is, and I, I can't get down by the way, so I'm just going to do it right here. She's got this little bottle. Jesus sitting there. She's listening to all he's saying. And her heart was so moved at what he was saying, and she knew that it was about her, that she would be a recipient of what he was about to do. She knew that what he was getting ready to, to go and do was going to affect her life. Because for, 
Her sins were forgiven. Her name was in the Lamb's book of life. She was now a child of the king. And she took the lid off and didn't even have to pour it out. The fragrance began to come out. You see, she took that which restricted the fragrance and put it aside. Sometimes if we'll just take what's restricting our worship and put it out of the way and allow our worship to go forth, you'll be amazed at how it affects other people in the house. You ever sit beside somebody that shouted? I know we say, well, I'd like to get away from them. No, get close up to them. Amen. Brother Johnson gets a, he gets a shout. If he goes running down the aisle one day, go run with him. Amen. I'm serious. Go run with him. You say, what do you mean? You, you'll, find all, it'll, it, you'll, get, you'll get a thrill. It's exhilarating. I'm, I don't know if you run. It's a, been a long time. If he decides to shout, shout with him a little bit. Amen. Take the cap off. Let the fragrance out. Let, let's worship. Let's, let's fill the place with His worship. Let's fill the house of God with worship. Let's fill it with His praise. Let's fill it with His glory. Let's fill it so others can see. Let's fill it to the point, my friend, when you walk out those doors and you go down to your business, you'll say, man, you'll not believe what happened at church today. And they'll say, what happened? You just got to come and see it. You'll just, you wouldn't believe it. When things begin to happen, two things are going to happen. Number one, it's going to attract people's attention. And number two, you're going to find yourself in adversity. You see, Satan don't want, he don't want you to worship. He don't want you to get excited. He don't want you to, my friend, how to get excited about what you got and who you are. He don't want you to tell people about Jesus. He don't want you to praise the Lord. He don't want you to take this message out to others. He don't want you to do that. And you know what we're doing? We're doing exactly what he wants us to do. You hate the devil, do what you what he don't want you to do. Tell people about Jesus. Worship. Take take the the cover off. Let the house be filled with worship. My friend, let the house be filled with all that's going on. And, and I want to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to find yourself being criticized from people inside the church. Yes, sir. They're going to say, well, they're just putting on a show. You know, what, you know what Judas Iscariot said? She's just a little over the top, ain't she? Why, why does she pour that ointment on the feet of Jesus? She, while well, she could have took that, sold it, we could have given it to the poor. That's a little bit, uh, that's, that's just too much. When I first started preaching, I started in April of 1980. And in that time, I started preaching, it was Oak Ridge Baptist Church, which is actually about, where the crow flies, about a quarter of a mile behind my house. My wife went there, and her mom and dad went there, and it was a wonderful church. We, uh, the church was growing. It was doing some great, I mean, doing some wonderful things in ministry, and, and I began to preach. And, and, and while, during that time, there were four preachers in the church. We had a revival meeting. We'd have a revival meeting on, in April and August. Well, in April that year, I announced my call to preach. Well, August came around, and the preacher came to preach. Man, alive. It was, that, what, it was exciting. It was just an exciting time. We went through that week of revival, and, and it was just the time when people were getting saved, and the church was being revived. And on Friday night, we took the cork out of the bottle. Preacher didn't preach. There was people shouting. There was people getting excited. And it, it wasn't just one here. It would start over here and over here. People started singing. People started testifying. People started doing this and people started doing that. I mean, it was just an amazing time in the house of God. And, and, and so we went through that revival. We went to the spring revival that next time and it happened again. And so we got through the spring revival, got to the fall revival, and, and, and we, man, it was just an amazing time. And somebody sent word and said, there ain't no need to go on Friday night. There won't be no preaching that night. They get excited over there. 
And you know, I never thought about that all those years, and I look back on that, and I think to myself, you know what had happened? We took the cork out, the aroma of the worship had gotten out and began to affect others. Worship. That's the fragrance of worship. And it, folks, I'm going to tell you, there'll be people that it'll get their attention, but it's also going to, they're going to, be, they're going to criticize but don't worry about that. Don't, don't let that bother you. Don't respond to the criticism, but just let the fragrance fill the air. Last thing I'm done, we find people that witness. All of us need to be a witness. Amen. We all need to be a witness. God needs workers. God needs worshipers. And God needs witnesses. All three. And all, we can do a little bit of all three of that. We need to work. We need to serve. We need to worship as much as we can. And we need to be a witness. Because you think about it just for a moment. The very center of all this was a man by the name of Lazarus, who just, a, uh, just about two weeks before this had been very, very sick. And the Bible says he was so sick that he was nigh unto death. And so Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, said, I, I, the one whom you love, our brother, he's sick. Would you come and, and do something? Maybe they were thinking of Jesus to get there the next day. Or, or maybe if he didn't even get there the next day, he could do something from afar off. And Lazarus would be healed and be back up and everything's gone. No, four days later, Lazarus died. He waited four days before he ever went over there. He got there and Martha said, Lord, if you'd been here, he'd be alive. Mary said, Lord, if you'd been here, he'd been alive. The shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five. 35. The Bible says in verse 34, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now some people say, well, he wept over Lazarus. I don't think he did. You know what I think he wept over? I think he wept over the fact that there were two sisters that didn't believe in him. As many times I've been in your house, you didn't trust me. As many times if I sat down and, and, and poured my heart out, you didn't believe in me. And he said, take the stone away. Lazarus come forth. Lazarus was raised. I don't know. I've often thought about how Lazarus felt. You ever thought about how Lazarus felt? Some people say, well, I bet he was relieved. Was he really? He's already in heaven. I mean, can you imagine being there in the paradise where it was those days? He was in eternity with God. And your voice, you hear a voice say, you can come back now. I don't want to leave, Lord. Got to come back. But he was raised. And man, what a witness. Sitting in the house next to the Lord was the man that had died and come back from the dead. Nobody ever done that before. Not, not since Elijah, Elijah raised one and Elisha raised one. Nobody done that. Nobody ever raised the dead. Oh, Jesus had done it a few times along the way. He had done that. But that people had never really seen. I mean, the magnitude of the people had seen this. They had never seen this before. And they had never seen somebody raised from the dead just like Lazarus was. And so we find two things happened that day. First of all, there was a tremendous response. They came everywhere. They came. Uh, let me just share this with you. If you had some, if Lazarus was right here, you know what you'd have? They, you, you couldn't get everybody in here. I want to go see who, I want to go see this man who was dead and was alive. I got to see this. They were crowded. They were everywhere. They were outside the house. They were crowds of people. They came to see Lazarus. They came to see Jesus, but they also, the Bible says they came to see Lazarus who was dead and is now alive. What a response. God had done something amazing. God, Jesus had done something amazing. He had been very sick. He had been to the point of death, and, and, and now he was alive, my friend. And, and of course, he was raised out of the tomb, and here he was sitting next to Jesus, back to life. This man had a witness. 
Can you imagine what it was? What a witness it was. What a response it was. Today, friends, we need to live a life to such an extent that people are attracted. They want to know what we've got. I have a friend who lives in Texas. My daughter lives in Austin, Texas, by the way. I've I got a daughter and three grandchildren out there. And I got a son and four grandchildren in Greensboro. And I got a daughter and four grandchildren in Wilkes. If y'all count that right, that's 11. I know. I seen your chin drop. You ain't. You, you don't look old enough to have 11 grandchildren. I know that. And my wife sure don't look old enough to be a grandma, does she? But I have a friend in Texas. His name's Ken, Ken Turry. Ken is, he is, to me, what a Christian ought to be. He is a man who is wise and compassionate and humble, and he stands on truth, but he is so loving and and he go the church he goes to is a good sized church and he has been meeting he meets I don't know what morning it is but he meets with a group of men and they have Bible study and he mentors some of them and then he meets with a a Muslim a young Muslim man he's a Muslim believer and they have breakfast together and they sit together and they they talk together and He's been coming to church, to a Christian church. And he sits and he listens. He's not gotten saved yet. And so Ken, I, I, he was talking to me about it. He said, I asked him, I said, why do you come to church? Why do you like coming here? He said, well, God's people are the happy people. He said, I, I love being in the church where people are happy. They're, uh, they're singing and they're, they're smiling and they, they exhibit a happiness. You know what that is? That's an attraction. That's the fragrance that attracts. We need, my friend, the world today needs to see men and women have died to self. See, Lazarus died, but he was raised again. When you and I got saved, we did something called baptism, and we died out to the old man, raised in newness of life. Yeah, we were made alive when we got saved, but that is our profession to the world, that I have put off the old life, and I've took on a new life. And if I take on a new life, doesn't something have to change? Amen. Amen. If, I, if, I'm, if I've laid that old life down, and that Lazarus laid an old life down, he was raised to newness of life. Symbolic of the fact that you and I, my friend, who were dead in our trespasses and sins, that Jesus raised us from the dead and gave us new life. A new hope, a new start, a new promise. We need to let them see resurrected people. You might say, what do you mean? I'm talking about us. And I'm going to be critical here, okay? I'm going to get critical with you. The church of today lives like we're dead. Yes, right. We need to be living like we're alive. Amen. I can imagine that Lazarus didn't waste a day. I bet he was excited and happy everywhere he went. Tell us what happened. Oh, man, tell us what happened. But you see, with the tremendous response came a threatening reaction. The chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. Why? Because the witness of Lazarus' new life was an enormously effective thing. It was touching people's, I mean, it was absolutely getting a hold of people. Matter of fact, listen to this. Look at verse 11. Because that by reason of him... Because by the reason of him, they believed on Jesus. Wouldn't it be something if they say because of Jonathan, they believed on Jesus. 
because of my wife Lisa, they believed on Jesus. My friend, I'm going to tell you, when people start getting saved and the church starts growing, it scares me. It excites me to no end. People say, man, it's an exciting time. It's a scary time. Why? Because there's an adversary. And he will not stop until he does everything he can to keep the props out, to divide the fellowship, to break, break up the unity. He'll do everything in his power to do that. He'll do it by threats and intimidation, just like our world is doing today. They're threatening. Any of y'all seen the movie God's Not Dead 2? Anybody seen that? I, we went and watched that last night. You say, you didn't study last night? No, I studied all morning, this morning. But we went and seen that last night. And I was, I was impressed. And I thought to myself, that, that, that don't even scratch the surface of how it really is the threats and the intimidation and all the stuff that is thrown against the child of God because we stand on this book. We stand on principles. We stand on things we know that can help people's lives. That can, that people, if they'll embrace it, they can be saved. They can miss hell. Think about that. They'll miss hell and go to heaven. So they set out a plot to get rid of Lazarus. You can be sure if you ever really learn the joy and how to serve with genuineness and have that fragrant spirit of Christ in your life and people start taking notice, just be ready for the backlash that comes with it. I appreciate your pastor a lot. I have... We're friends on Facebook. You say you do Facebook? Well, I do. And I, I get on there sometimes and I, I, I see what he's got to say. And he says some things that people, they throw some arrows at him. It aggravates me to no end. I want to get on there and absolutely just choke some of them people, but I can't get to them. <laughs> because what he's saying is the truth. It is. But always you gotta have somebody that's gotta, they gotta bite back. And I'm thinking, my word, this is true. It's true. Think about it. It's true. But if you do something for Christ, expect adversity and an adversary. Yes, sir. It's gonna happen. I want us to stand tonight. I know, preacher, you've been along. I know that. You don't have to tell me that. I told you I'd preach as long as I drove, so let's bow our heads a minute. I'm going to ask the pianist to come, she will. Pick out a hymn of invitation, and or they can play one on the overhead. Would you come to the piano, please? Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you tonight, and thank you for letting us be here for your word. I know, God, that... Our part's been very feeble tonight, but I pray that you'll use our feebleness and God, you'll just put a power upon it to reach our hearts. Help us tonight, Lord, to be challenged. God, that will be a worker, but Lord, be a worker that takes time to worship. God, that will be a worshiper, Lord, that is not inhibited by God the others, what they think and what they say. God, that we'll be a witness, Lord, like Lazarus was, to touch the hearts of people. Because, Lord, we know that our reason for being here is to share Jesus with the world and to win souls and bring them into the family of God. We know, Lord, all around us tonight there are people dying and they're going to hell. And, Lord, it breaks my heart that I can't reach them and I can't do something to bring them in. And I just pray, help us, God, to be the worker, the worshiper, and the witness that we need to be. Until that day, you call us home. Speak to hearts tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, altars open if you need to come. If you've got a need on your heart, if you need to bring something before the throne of grace, somebody before the throne of grace, or you need to come tonight and worship. Maybe you need to come renew your worship. Say, Lord, I'm so sorry. 
I've neglected my worship. I've been so conscious of what others think or what somebody might say or how they might receive me that I've just not turned loose and worshiped. How about it tonight? If God spoke to your heart, you got a need, do bring it to Him. This is revival. It's a time for renewal. It's a time for rededication. It's a time for reaffirmation. It's a time to be restored. It's a time for God to stir the fires in our heart so we can go out and be an effective witness to those around us. How about it tonight? Johnson. Okay. Amen. We have to believe the invitation is sufficient this evening. How many of you are glad you came to the house of the Lord? Amen. Wasn't that some good preaching? Now y'all know I told him not to preach as long as he drove here. No, I'm kidding. I appreciate Brother Tim and his ministry and his blessing. And his church, I appreciate his church too. I appreciate him minding the Lord tonight. It's ever heart free tonight before we dismiss. Burr's family, thank y'all so much for singing for us yes. tonight. We well, appreciate it. It was a blessing to us. Y'all definitely be back. If you want to come back, you're welcome back anytime. Amen. Anything else on anybody's heart tonight?